Could I ask you uh, for a lecture? Uh, good morning. Uh, it's actually a, a great privilege and, and also a great responsibility to to address you on on the subject of uh, copyright reform and uh, what it could be in a post-ACTA world. Uh, as you know, the Polish civil society movements have been a key factor in raising awareness and among uh, uh, European policymakers of the stakes of uh, sharing uh, access to culture, uh, freedoms on the internet uh, in uh, the context of ACTA and they, they played a role and the first thing I should mention as a, a member of an advocacy group is my, my gratefulness to, to this action of the Polish civil society. Now, uh, I am uh, within the advocacy groups on, on internet freedoms, I'm sort of a uh, uh, an unusual person in the sense that I spend most of my time working on, on policy proposals. I, I try to spend as little of my time as possible fighting bad laws, even though it seems that my country uh, doesn't make much efforts to make my life easy on this front because they produce uh, a great number of bad laws. But uh, nonetheless, I, I try to invest the time in uh, concrete proposals, so what you may have seen for some of you in my recent book and what you will hear today is the product of this effort and this effort is conducted with many other people including in this country uh, but I must first of all say that I, I am of course not a specialist of the cultural economy and the cultural practices in Poland I have a total lack of linguistic skill uh, in Polish, so I, I, I beg for your indulgence in terms of saying things that might not apply to the Polish situation. Uh, the first thing I would like to stress, uh, I know I was probably invited to address you because of my work on uh, recognizing the non-commercial activities of individuals, in particular file sharing, uh, and uh, developing new financing models for the cultural economy in the digital age. But this is only part of a wider landscape. So I think it's very important as you are going to, uh, I think these days there are already a number of uh, uh, processes that are worked at work in Poland to discuss copyright reform and there will be a new momentum for them. So I think it's very important to keep this wider perspective. So what you see here is basically um, uh, I'm trying to produce, uh, uh, I think in the correct word in, in, in English is a stray man uh, uh, master plan, that is master plan that is there to be fired at by all the critics, but uh, as the merit of existing. So it's, this is my master plan for reforming uh, not just uh, copyright, but also the whole set of culture and media policies that surround copyright. Uh, and of course, there are many other things. For example, everything connected to patents and innovation that are not there. And uh, I don't have the time in this talk to detail every point, but what is important is there are, there are four blocks. And the two blocks on, on the left, there are blocks about non-market activities, activities that take place outside of the mar market sphere with, without monetary transaction. There are the things we always forget when we discuss culture in policy-making context because there is so much focus on the economy that we do not uh, realize that culture exists because of these non-market activities. So 
these non market activities they are split in two blocks one is activities of individuals and activities of individuals have taken an unprecedented importance in the context of the internet because there are things that today individuals can do that were up to very recently reserved to big professional or industrial organizations like distributing works of art and culture uh, like even producing works in many media so uh, of course this is this is what some people would like to corner or even to suppress these abilities, these new abilities of individuals, but it is also what gives us the promise of what I call a, a many to all cultural society, that is a society where many people produce works uh, with all the spectrum of uh, possible quality, competence, interest, whatever that means for a given recipient, uh, but uh, and all of us can access or and engage in these activities. This said, there are more ancient non-market activities that take place in a collective context. Uh, the context of memory institutions, the context of the educational system, uh, the context of uh, um, mediation uh, between works of art and culture and the public. Uh, these things, we should not forget about them because it would be uh, paradoxical if we give new rights to the individual citizens and at the same time we would deprive the institutions that uh, promote culture and, and knowledge and access to them uh, from the corresponding rights. On the right side, you have everything that concerns the economy and uh, the infrastructure. Uh, the economy, uh, I have put it under the label of uh, cultural fair trade district, uh, publishing and distribution. But there is a possible uh, uh, misunderstanding with the use of the word fair trade uh, in the sense that uh, what I mean is uh, actually I think in culture Fair trade is the only acceptable model. It's not uh, 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 the other models should not be called normal trade. They should be called unfair trade, which is uh, something which uh, I will I will come back to. Uh, there are lots of things to make a better cultural economy beyond recognizing the rights of individuals to share. Uh, ensuring that all works of art can be equally distributed uh, to the public by, by platforms, uh, uh, renewing with a tradition of trying to get fair contracts between authors, publishers and distributors when the contracts have become more unfair with every step of the cultural industry development. Uh, also fighting against the uh, monopolies of distribution which are a key uh, property of, of the digital economy when you let it flow without giving rights to the public and without fighting abuse of a, a dominant position. Then you have infrastructure. The infrastructure there are actually at least three types of infrastructure. You have infrastructure of the internet, and it's, uh, uh, we <coughs> often do not realize that we were blessed with a miracle of having uh, reasonably open computing equipment and a neutral internet, at least for fixed line internet. This did not happen. This happened because a very small number of people wanted it to happen and because the others were too stupid to realize what it would bring. It's, it did not happen because everybody was conscious that was the thing we needed. But today, it will survive only if everybody uh, becomes conscious. This is, we must stand by this. We must not let, for example, 
the fact that now we access internet through mobile equipment, we must not let it turn the internet in a control garden for a number of telecommunication operators or in a, in a vertically integrated market of content services and use. Uh, but you have also the legal infrastructure that is reforming really the core foundations of uh, copyright and authors rights law and you have also the tax infrastructure that plays a very important role because of the importance of the public subsidies for, for culture but also uh, because of many uh, I don't know what is the exact name actually but in French we call them parafiscal mechanisms that if there are, there are fees uh, uh, or, or levies uh, that are collected and that fuel a system of generally curated financing to culture. So that's it for the global landscape. If you wish in the question part that we come back to this, we will. One last point on the first point is as I know, there is a, a big discussion with collecting societies in Poland, like in every other European country. The issue of reforming the governance of collecting societies is a key one if we want to get a better cultural economy. Now uh, I come to uh, the, uh, the one of the two core elements of what I hope to convey today. The first one is to incite you to take a fresh look at what sharing of digital works with, between individuals is. And to do that, I first would like to remind you that sharing works is today a right. Uh, uh, it's a right under the first cell doctrine uh, which is in continental Europe called the Exhaustion of Rights Doctrine. Uh, and basically what it says, uh, if, uh, if I had time to find a, a, a bilingual edition of uh, one of the great Polish poets uh, yesterday in Paris, uh, I, could have, I could have read it, uh, the French part, and, and then I, could, I would be free to give it to any of you. And actually, I could be free to lend it to any of you, and I would even be free to sell it to any of you. And this would be tax-free. Uh, uh, so there is this, this right didn't come by chance. It came in because it was an essential component of creating a shared culture. Uh, there are people who fought for it. It didn't happen by chance. So. Uh, when we came to the, the, the digital world, we decided, often without really knowing we were doing it, to cancel these rights or to fail to give them a new meaning in the digital world. Actually, you can do even more things. Uh, uh, looks very strange, but it's, it's perfectly legal to cut a book in, in 10 slices. Uh, Actually, I do that uh, when I go hiking in the mountains and you know, books are heavy. Uh, and that, uh, so often there is a short supply of book and then if you cut books in slices, you can uh, have one person read the first slice and then hand it to another person. And, uh, it's, uh, and so you can have several persons reading one book in parallel, one physical book. Of course, it's a bit destructive process it looks like a, a strange practice of a hiker sect, or, but actually this practice is at the core of our culture as the civilization of books. Uh, in, in the 13th century, where, when universities were born, uh, there, were, there was a certain uh, demand for copies of books. Uh, the books at the time, they were not printed, they were codices, they were, they were simply bound as books with pages, but they were not uh, uh, printed. And so to produce them, you had to copy them. And the monks, the principal source of copies 
uh, we're not delivering at a satisfying pace for for uh, the demands of students and teachers of uh, newborn universities. So what happened, they, there was a development of uh, uh, corporations such as uh, binders, illuminators, but also uh, corporations such as copiers. And what happened is, of course, these were analog copies done by human beings, so they were full of mistakes. Uh, the, the copies of copies propagated, and they were. We did not have the, the the great thing of a perfect digital copy, so the copies were very poor quality. And the universities at the time they, they cared very much for for access to knowledge, and particularly for access to their knowledge, which was often at a component of propaganda also. And so they they decided this cannot last. So they, they decided to host reference copy of books. These reference copies were called exemplar. And uh, I don't know if the word exists in some form in, in, uh, in Polish, but in, in most Latin languages, it means today a copy of a book. Uh, but in reality, at the time, it meant the one reference copy that is the approved copy. And the exemplars were not bound. And you know why they were not bound? They were not bound because they were kept in separate folio, so several copiers could copy a book at the same time. Uh, because at the time, the institution of knowledge wanted as many people to have access to copies and to high quality copies as possible. So we should re remind ourselves of this situation and ask ourselves, what does it mean in the digital world? Uh, Actually, in the digital world, this type of, uh, uh, of, of practices are different. Uh, they include the possibility to uh, uh, co produce additional copies. Uh, the exhaustion of right in the physical career uh, world did not extend to the reproduction right. Uh, and there is a good reason for that, is that the reproduction right could be exerted only for commercial players. For, uh, and in the digital world, uh, copies are, are produced either on the em uh, emitter or distributor side or on the receiving side. What, what is new in the digital world is that uh, uh, when we have digital copies, we can do, uh, and they are in open formats, and they are freely usable, we can do incredible things. For example, we can get students in literature, like this teacher here has done, Mr. Scottis, uh, working on a, on a piece of literature and massively commenting it uh, in order to annotating it as a marginalia. This type of stuff, Today, it occurs mostly with ancient books. I have uh, books that are in the public domain. This is not because uh, it would not be allowed to do it on recent books, because in the US, where this is taking place, this would be fair use. But you cannot find a good access to these public domain books that it will be easily transferable in a system like that. This is to remind us that freedom is not just about the right to do something, it's also about the ability to do it. Now, let's go back to the use rights of individuals in the digital sphere. Basically, we had a choice. Either we say, uh, well, in the digital world, if we recognize the right to share between people, digital works, uh, it will be, uh, it will lead to an immensely extended scale of sharing. It will make the public a distributor of uh, works in its own right, uh, a, a competitor with a monopoly of distribution that the publishers uh, and their subcontractors had up to recently. This is unacceptable. Uh, and this is basically the track we have followed. That is, we have passed law after law 
to uh, Article 3.3 3, uh, of the co European Copyright Directive basically say, you know, the first sale doctrine or exhaustion of, doc of right doctrine will not apply. Uh, it says that. And, uh, uh, and the Court of Justice recently said, well, let's think about it twice. At least it should apply when you download something. Uh, so uh, this, this was not an obvious decision, and I think it was taken even without any debate uh, at the time. What is the other path we could have followed? Uh, we could recognize an other version of exhaustion of rights, which would be at the same time more restricted and, and more open than the one that existed for works on carriers such as books and records or cassettes or DVDs. Uh, by the way, DVDs uh, leaving aside the DRMs. Uh, on, uh, why is it more open? Because it has to include the rights to make copy. What, why is it more restrictive? Because we can keep it only to the non-commercial, non-market sphere. Uh, so, uh, basically, all of my work on these topics has been to detail how this could function and how it, it could possibly be associated with new uh, sources of financing for creative and expressive activities. I insist on the possibly, in the sense that for me, uh, recognizing the right to share between individuals is not something that is dependent on new financing schemes. Uh, because it is a, a fundamental cultural right. It is the implementation, you know, Article 27.1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of a city. I'm not suggesting to define sharing as a new fundamental right, but what I mean is the right to take a work you have in your possession, a file representing a work, and give it to someone else. This is the basic cultural empowerment that everyone should have it is the condition for a shared culture, so it is a condition for the contemporary exercise of this right to freely participate in the cultural life of the city. Uh, this was the bit to explain that sharing is a legitimate activity, uh, but sharing is also a useful act uh, activity in the sense that sharing enables us, enables the public to correct what is an immense cultural failure of the digital cultural uh, economy, uh, in the sense that if it is driven only by the business models of centralized publishing and distribution, what happens is these intermediaries and in a way, uh, to a lesser extent, the search intermediaries, Google type, uh, have every interest to concentrate the attention of the public on as limited as possible a set of works. And they do succeed in doing it with the exception of a correction that is given to that by the fact that the public is able to act as a distributor, is able to uh, uh, bring the attention of someone else on a piece of work. Uh, I know, of course, that people say, oh, all you have to do is to make a recommendation, uh, to make a, a link to an official site where you can listen to 30 seconds of a soundtrack or whatever. But the real way in which it is done is not this one. It is the way of taking a work a full file and sending or making available to another person. And sometimes, not even that, sharing a full record library. Uh, when Napster was created, Sean Fanning, how long? Well, half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Uh, when, sharing, when, when Sean Fanning developed uh, an Napster, he talked about it as a tool for pulling personal record libraries. He didn't talk 
talk about it as a free download for all system. Uh, it was it, this going back to this design uh, that sharing is useful because it allows people to pull their, their taste, their interest among community of interest is going to enable a much more diverse and lively cultural scene. And actually, the war against sharing is preventing this uh, uh, ripening, this development of a cultural economy. What happens when sharing is, is uh, uh, stigmatized, is polluted, uh, is, uh, and is repressed, is that people focus on sharing as fast as they can everything that can come in their hands. And this is basically what's happening today. Uh, 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 and it leads to the promotion of uh, forms of sharing, uh, such as, of course, the worst ones, that is centralized download, uh, with the heaviest uh, demand content uh, being intentionally promoted by, by their, the owners of the site, such as Mega Upload, but also uh, uh, to somewhat of a somewhat perverse use of BitTorrent. You said BitTorrent is a wonderful protocol that can give anybody the possibility to distribute video to the full planet, uh, and it will scale up if demand scales up. It's wonderful, but BitTorrent trackers uh, have become a place where you have a, a faster rotation of the most demanded content, and only those are are truly visible, and so. With a war on sharing, we, what happens is sharing does not disappear, but sharing is less valuable culturally. Uh, I know, I, I know there are people when we see curves, I mean, they, they were traumatized in, in uh, secondary education, and when they see curves, they, they feel very, uh, uh, they feel it's complicated. But this is not complicated. This is simply a comparison between sharing uh, in a, among, uh, between the access among two million works, in the case of uh, music, uh, on one, uh, the, the curve above is access on the iTunes of the time. I mean, this was, I think, in 2008. And the, uh, the curve below, is the access for uh, 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 the, uh, sharing on the Emule proto under the Emule protocol on the donkey servers at the time. Uh, and what you see is both curves are quite concentrated in the sense that uh, 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 the hits are always the hits, even in file sharing. People like to like the same thing. Uh, but if you look at uh, the rank of popularity between 2% and 30% of the works, that is uh, between uh, 40,000 and, uh, and uh, 600,000, you will see that in one case, uh, they receive only 10% of the attention of the public. In the other case, they receive six times more attention. These, these intermediary popularity works, they are the reservoir of cultural diversity. So to, they are works that have been appreciated already by enough people, that means a few hundred. So you're sure they are not total crap. Uh, uh, and, but, so they deserve to be presented to another audience. I mean, they might, some people might think that they are total crap, but it doesn't matter if other people think they are interesting. Uh, now, let's come to the sustainability of uh, a many tool digital culture. What I would like to stress here is that because we were so much focused on fighting against the robber pirates, we have failed to identify what is a key challenge of digital culture. And this key challenge
comes from the very uh, good properties of digital culture in the sense that many people can produce work and make them available to a universal public and they can much easier than before progress in making uh, works that are more interesting in forms or content or relevance or ways to interact with their audience. Uh, this means that today we have more works and more creative people at every level of competence and quality than ever. And when I say more works, I don't mean 5% more. I mean in some cases, uh, if you look at the case of photography, uh, of generally available photographs that you can at least download on the web, you will see that we have uh, millions of people who produce high quality photographs. Has, has the photography economy collapsed? Well, it's bigger than ever. I mean, Kodak has collapsed. Uh, uh, but uh, the economy of photography overall has not collapsed. Uh, there are more people that live today of taking photographs than ever. Nonetheless, there are problems. Uh, to, if I take again the example of photography, there are two obvious problems, investigative reporting and stock archives. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult than before to be paid to buy uh, a press agency to do an investigative reporting in a faraway country for six months. Uh, and stock archives, they have all either disappeared or they were bought by Corbis, not for Corbis to sell their stock, but for Corbis to keep in store their stock when they focus on selling only 200,000 photographs uh, that are the highest demand photographs. So here we see that we, one of the first challenge is in this wonderful transition to digital culture, we have some functions uh, of production or of uh, memory that could become often, that could become no longer provided by players that have a reasonable sustainability. Here, I put you a figure that is already outdated. It's from a study that uh, uh, was published by a researcher called Valérie de Rouen in 2010. Uh, and the figures are for 2009. And they come for EU 27. Uh, uh, all the, and you see that 20% of Europeans age 16 or more uh, produce contents for sharing on the net. Can be mostly text, photographs, uh, 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 short videos, uh, all types of contents. Uh, some of these contents, actually many of them, might be seen only by five persons. Or, or listen to, uh, but they are accessible to everybody, provided you know they exist, and or you can find them. Uh, surprisingly, one could have thought that this de huge development of digital uh, production and access to culture would uh, lead to a disaffection for cultural and artistic practice that occurs outside of the digital kingdom. And the contrary has happened. Between 1920 and 1925, which I, I, I call the era of the cultural industry, uh, there was a constant and slow decrease in cultural and artistic practice. And since 95, all the studies I mean, I said there was a constant and slow decrease. I have no proof for it, I should say. Uh, it's just that what is for sure is since 95, there was a constant and slow increase in cultural practice. And 95 is not, I mean, it's not a proof of causality, but it's the, the date at which the web became massively accessible in developed countries. And when the, the practices I'm speaking of here, 
This is uh, acting in theater, playing a musical instrument, not, not a digital one, uh, or digital one or not. Uh, singing, writing, painting, drawing, uh, uh, dancing, uh, not just uh, in parties, oh, it's very much okay also. Uh, so, now let's look at the figures and I beg for your indulgence for some of these figures. We have seen that people who contribute to works is something like 20% of the adult population. I have tried to define the notion of a serious effort or invested contributor. Of course, uh, this is not something you can define rigorously, but it is someone who uh, uh, exhibits or states some intention to, to become better at what one is doing, uh, uh, to, in, to make content more appealing by form, more interesting by content or, or relevance. Uh, uh, a typical example is a blogger that says, oh, I've done this blog for two years, but I have to stop, it takes too much of my time, and I'm frustrated that I cannot progress in, in, in doing it. So, my guesstimate is that uh, this might represent about 10% of the people who produce content on the net. But if it is 5 or 20, or I, actually nobody knows. Uh, but it's still important to realize how, how many people this could represent. Now, let's look at how many people receive money from the copyright system in, in the widest sense, not just uh, uh, authors, but also neighboring rights like a musical performance. That is a quite stable figure across all countries. I have no clue how many, how many it is in uh, uh, in Poland, but here it is over a period of five years how many people have received some money from the copyright system. Uh, and it, it's around 0.4% of the population. Now, how many people receive serious money from the copyright system? This is, uh, by serious money, I mean uh, minimum wage or median wage uh, in a year. Uh, this is uh, about a thousandth uh, of the, uh, uh, the number of contributors, uh, one hundredth of the number of serious A4 contributors. Uh, and now, how many people does it take to capture among living artists, and of course, we are not speaking here of the heirs of artists, of the uh, people who have stocks of copyright or whatever. We are speaking about living, creative, and expressive people. Uh, how many of them capture half of all the benefits of the copyright system? That's 0.002% uh, of the adult population. This means uh, 12, uh, 1,200 people in France, uh, 1,600 in Germany. Half of them are writers, by the way, uh, not uh, uh, and uh, so, now, can we seriously think we are going to cope with the challenges of producing a many old digital culture with a system that serves to the highest degree only one on 10,000 of the population of creative people? Uh, creative, uh, I mean, with a modest meaning of that. Huh? I'm not speaking the eternal professional artist that is only of this creation. Uh, so, the real challenge, if we must recognize, recognize me, acknowledge, uh, uh, express uh, gratefulness or uh, appreciation. Rewarding, uh, I mean, uh, some people are hostile to reward because they say we are not just. Uh, good pupils that must be rewarded, we must, but you can put remuneration if you prefer it to rewarding. Uh, financing, uh, uh, that's because of course, what would be the purpose of re rewarding or recognizing if there was nothing to rewise, re, uh, reward or recognize. Uh, so, 
to make that possible, I have suggested, in addition to all the existing skills that are not going to disappear, because most of them have nothing to fear from the recognition of file sharing, and even many of them have everything to benefit for, from the recognition of file sharing. Among those are obviously public performance and theater projection, where there is a definite proof that they have an excellent synergy with file sharing. Uh, uh, the theater in France in uh, 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 European theaters for movies have a, a perfect positive correlation with the degree of sharing of audiovisual and cinematographic contents. Uh, so let's put it just in the most neutral manner. Uh, so one is not accused to hide the sad <coughs> aspects of it. Uh, the creative contribution, as I propose it, is a statutory, meaning compulsory, flat rate contribution by broadband internet subscribers uh, with a demanding definition of broadband. Because if you, if you are asked to contribute to the ecosystem of shareable works and you cannot access it yourself, uh, it's a bit, bit of uh, unfairness, so you have to have real broadband. Uh, real broadband, I mean uh, no less than uh, uh, at least 256 uh, kilobit upload. Uh, uh, and it's used to reward shared digital works and to finance creative projects and the environment of creation. Now, philosophically, it is something that has nothing to do with copyright. Ah. Because if it is legally based on the exhaustion of rights, it is not based on a copyright that would be exist and would be compensated for, it or, or you would compensate for the inability to enforce it. It's based on the definition of new rights, and these rights are social rights. Uh, I, I know social might have uh, uh, sometimes a discu disputable meaning. Uh, I hesitated to call them soci societal rights, but I thought people would not understand. So uh, uh, in which sense are they social rights? In the sense that uh, uh, they are they belong only to living persons. They are not inheritable uh, or only at a very limited extent, like uh, retirement uh, funds can be sometimes uh, transferred to schools. Or, uh, they are, and there are rights among a universal community of peers, that is, the communities of people who can access and can emit on the internet. Uh, in addition to recognizing the social rights, uh, I include also a specific device to prevent valuable editorial functions uh, from becoming organic. We have to realize it's a big risk. Why? Because these functions were traditionally ended within publishing organization. For example, art and repertoire for music or uh, uh, copy editing uh, in the most noble sense, that is uh, turning a book length text into a book. Uh, this is, uh, these are functions that are, were done by staff within publishing houses. Uh, right now, it's no longer the case. They are done by low paid freelance writers where they still exist. Uh, uh, but in, there is a risk that with the change in the structure of publishing, this function would simply, I would not say disappear, but they will, lots of the know-how that came with them would be lost. Now, what, what is not the con creative contribution? It's not a conversation for the harm caused by sharing. Because you have, a, I, I quote about 10 studies in my book, 
Uh, and if you want to be very honest, you would say that the, uh, they conclude that even in domains where they were, there was a shrinking of the market, such as music published by the majors, uh, at most 20% and possibly 0% of these losses are due to non-commercial sharing between individuals. Uh, so uh, there is also evidence that the macroeconomic sectoral economy for every media has never stopped growing, including for music. Uh, uh, when you include concert, musical instruments, uh, teaching, public and private teaching of music, uh, etc. So, if we would design a scheme that would be based just on compensating for the harm of sharing, well, that would mean much less money. Uh, much less money and probably going to the wrong people. Uh, so uh, I suggest we rather try to address uh, the, uh, uh, the, the real challenge of digital culture. And you know, the big names, well, don't, don't worry. They will be OK also in the sharing world. I mean, actually, they know it so well that uh, Alicia Keys uh, married the CTO of uh, uh, Mega Upload. So uh, it's, it, they know there is no problem for them. Now, last point, because I think I'm almost done with my time, and I want you to have all the space for questions. I will do two more slides first. Uh, one is just to mention that it should be all media, for all reasons. For the first thing is, the war on sharing, you have only seen the first skirmishes. Wait for books, or more precisely, do not wait for books because it's already there. Already now, you have, uh, books are locked behind DRMs, uh, uh, in proprietary devices that are manufactured by people who control the full editorial chain, in the case of Amazon, and have a strong power on the editorial ch chain in the case of Apple. Uh, so all works, including internet native, including voluntary shared under creative licenses, it would be, because it would be incredible that everybody would be rewarded, except the people who have already started to share voluntarily their, their material. Uh, but not not at any time. That is, there are very important moral rights, attribution, which is never any problem, and divulgation right. And I suggest that we create a specific divulgation right for the digital world. That is, the right to share should apply only when a work has been distributed to the public in digital form, whether commercially or uh, uh, not without commercial transaction. The other should keep the right to decide if, I, if a novelist wants books, his books to be only in uh, paper books, I think we should respect that decision, uh, which means, uh, you know, no camcording of movies, no recording of concerts, no book scanning. Uh, but, of course, uh, and then everybody is going to ask, oh, but it's happening today, how are you going to enforce that? My uh, optimistic, because as you have, may have noticed, I'm an optimistic person, uh, my optimistic view is once you recognize true rights of the public, the public is the best source of uh, uh, voluntary adhesion to norms and standards. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the worst things that the evolution of copyright law has done to us is to, to uh, negate the notion that on the internet civilization. There is not just, you know, a bunch of robbers. There are people who think about what is right to do or not. And if you look at the Direct Connect Hub, uh, uh, that is uh, a way of to do peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, uh, 
with rules about what you share or you don't share, with a forum where you discuss what you would like to see shared or not, if you look at that, you will see these norms at work. Now, how much <coughs> I've done an economic model, it's, you can run it yourself for Poland, uh, going to the book site, which is, whose URL is in my presentation, uh, there are arbitrary decisions, but not that arbitrary, because if you play with the models, you will see that you cannot do uh, what you want, decide that you will reward many, many people and each of them a lot. Of course, it's going to be very costly. But this, uh, and also if you revive not more, you reward more, not more people than the copyright system, it's uh, have, and, and it's the same ones, uh, it will have limited uh, interest. Uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know what is, would be the equivalent, equivalent for, for Western Europe, the US and uh, Japan and countries like that, everything converges uh, get around an idea of five euro per month per uh, broadband subscriber. Uh, in countries like Brazil, the proposals are around one, the equivalent of one euro fifty to two euros. Uh, what it would be in Poland is probably somewhere between the two. And by the way, it provides us with something a kind of graal of the cultural economy uh, that uh, uh, the publishers have been start looking for forever. They would like to do differential pricing. Uh, that is to sell works uh, cheaper to poor or, or mildly interested customers and more uh, at a higher price. And for that, unfortunately, they can't do it because it would require full control on the chronology of media on the geography of exchange, so they can't do it at all. Uh, but contributory things, you can differentiate them. So you can have five euro per month in, in France and, and or Germany, one euro fifty in Brazil, and zero euro in Cameroon or Mali. Uh, this, I just show it, I will not, uh, I'm, I'm done with my time, I want to leave you the floor, but uh, 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 what is important is uh, here, this is a model for Germany, uh, once again uh, there are, there is guidance on how to run the model for a new country, it requires looking at uh, a number of statistics that are not always easy to find, but uh, uh, for me, it was really impossible due to my lack of uh, linguistic skill to find them in, in Polish. Uh, so, but the main thing to realize is a scheme like the creative contribution will not give loads of money to many people. Uh, it will give uh, a complementary income and recognition to a large set of contributors and it, it will give a significant support to a limited number of them. Uh, and that, of course, is dependent on how much observed diversity of access we will have, uh, which can only be guessed today. I have made four different hypotheses about it. Uh, and it's dependent also on which reward function uh, we will use, because in the physical career world, uh, a book uh, writer is remunerated between 3 and 18% uh, uh, per copy sold uh, on the uh, VAT free price. Uh, it is, uh, uh, this means, and of course it's the biggest seller who get the 18%. The biggest seller of the biggest selling material that is uh, novels. So, uh, uh, in the digital world, there is every reason so uh, to reverse that. That is, instead of giving more money per copy to the people who sell many copies, in the digital world it makes sense to give less money to the people who receive or sell, uh, who get access or sell more copies. Uh, but, of course, this is uh, 
something which will be hard to get. But when you hear a copyright theologian saying, oh, proportional remuneration is uh, 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 the true law of copyright, remember this 1 to 20 remuneration in copyright is not proportional, it's much more than proportional. Uh, so if it is not proportional, it can be also less than proportional. Uh, I, uh, I know the worst questions uh, regard the details, uh, so they are, I'm forced to tell you if you, you would be, make me a great honor by reading my tentative treatment of how data uh, can be collected and in a, a privacy respectful manner and in a manner that is uh, relatively precise, certainly more precise than the random uh, measure of uh, public performance of music in uh, uh, hairdressers. Uh, but the, uh, and uh, also uh, resistant to fraud. Uh, lastly, maybe there is, I've suggested that there is about a third of the money that goes to uh, upfront financing, financing for creating new works, financing for uh, uh, helping organizations that are useful such as a true music label or uh, a mediation or environment in which people recognize quality among an ocean of work. Uh, and about two thirds of a bit less to remunerate uh, sharing. Uh, uh, but that should be very different across media because there are media like uh, feature films or, or full length films, let's say also documentaries, where uh, you need, uh, the key question uh, is how do I know the ne do the next one? Huh? Nobody cares about getting, getting paid after because actually very few people are. What they want is to get the money to do the next work. And there are other domains where people will do, you know, digital writing today of literature or fiction. Uh, this is occurring, there is a site in China where there are 1,100,000 writers of novels. Okay. Uh, uh, so the, mostly the, gen, the, the, the uh, types of works that were forbidden, like romance. Uh, so don't imagine that we will we'll ever see a shortage of writing, a shortage of music playing or whatever. Uh, the question is we, we must be able to, re to recognize and reward uh, the valuable stuff. So for these media, we need more exposed rewards and less ex ante support. Uh, even though there is lots of hidden ex ante support, like teaching, uh, because uh, stop, uh, uh, let's say, cancel education, and you will see a big shortage in literature. Uh, so because most of the uh, literature writers have some teaching activities in, in, in most countries. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, once again, all the models, the software running the models, the interactive models that you can run on the site, uh, the data sets, uh, the text of a book in commentable form, all this is in, on a special site we have produced, and I urge you uh, to visit it. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>